Hello, I'm the Resolute Cartographer, and this is the story of what happened in Sutton, West Virginia. If you've watched any of my other videos in this style, you know that I generally cover one city and its history within the Fallout universe, and then its history within the real world. This video will be slightly different in that I'm going to cover the in-game history of Sutton and the real-world histories of both Sutton and Flatwoods, West Virginia. I'm going to be doing this because Flatwoods and Sutton are within the same county, Braxton County, in the real world. They are in fact little over five miles apart. To cover the history of Sutton in the real world and Flatwoods in a different video would require me to cover a lot of the same ground in both videos. That being said, I'm going to start with the layout of Sutton and its resemblance, or to an extent the lack thereof, to the real world Sutton. We'll then move on to the history of Sutton in the Fallout universe, and cap it off with the history of Sutton and Flatwoods in the real world. In my videos covering Grafton and Clarksburg, and Beckley and Welch, I've noted that the city's in-game are switched in location relative to each other's location in the real world. This is the case with Sutton and Flatwoods as well. In the real world, Flatwoods lies a little over 5 miles northeast of Sutton, while in the Fallout universe, it is Sutton that lies east of Flatwoods. In game, Sutton is laid out primarily on a north to south line, centered on Highway 86B, which is locally known as Main Street. In the real world, Sutton is laid out primarily from west to east on County Route 19, also locally known as Main Street. The only other road they share in common is 3rd Street, while in the real world, Sutton has 1st through 6th streets, with Lyon Street in between 1st and 2nd. Along with their locations relative to each other being switched, in-game Flatwoods has the river, and Sutton has the rail line, while in the real world Sutton lies on the Elk River, and Flatwoods has the rail line. This is not to say that real world Sutton has never had a rail line running through it, and in fact I found a site listing defunct and abandoned rail lines that showed me that Sutton has in its history had two different rail lines running to it, one from Flatwoods, and another from Gasaway, a town to the west of Sutton. But back to in-game Sutton. Sutton is home to eight houses, a mobile home, a pair of garages, a delicatessen, a clothing shop, a barber shop, a pharmacy, a liquor store, a feed store, a bookstore, a red rocket gas station, a train station, and a church. The center of town has a series of high barricades constructed after the war, and there's a trailer home in the midst of these barricades that appears to have served as a restaurant or bar. But before we get into the history of the town and the Fallout universe, let's get into the closest sites. To the northeast is the small tourist town of Helvetia, where Fosnock takes place every spring. To the east of Sutton, perched on the hills above, lies the East Kanawha Overlook. Up the hill to the west lies the feral, ghoul-infested New River Gorge Resort. With the background out of the way, let's get into the stories. The people of Sutton appear to have lived an idyllic life in the years before the war, relative to the other towns of Appalachia at least. Unlike the towns with the worker riots, heavy pollution, and political unrest, the people of Sutton appear to have lived relatively peaceful lives. There is unfortunately a dearth of first-hand sources on the lives of the pre-war denizens, but there is a pre-war note and post-war recollections of pre-war events that we can draw upon, and the environmental storytelling as well. First we look to Clara, a former Nuka-Cola chemist who appears to have grown a conscience and quit her job just before the war. In a note she leaves for her already past mother, she excoriates herself for making Nuka-Cola addictive, and swears revenge on the marketing department that pushed profitability over consumer safety. With a trip to the Nuka-Cola plant, we can find the lab she once worked in, and a note she left for her co-worker Alexis, in which she explains that she took all the toxic and radioactive chemicals with her and went home to Sutton. On a shelf by this note, we can find toxic water, nuclear waste, and other poisons. It appears that she missed some chemicals, or was caught attempting to leave and they were returned. The taste testing sign in required testers to sign a waiver explaining that they might be exposed to poisons, making clear that this was a regular occurrence at the Kanawa Nuka-Cola plant at the very least, and it may have been spread across the system. One taster said that the soda was making their teeth itch. To investigate this claim, we can research the code name for the soda that they tested on the research terminal. This soda, NCB02A6A1, was a test version of Nuka-Cola Black, the coffee-based Nuka-Cola flavor. It appears that the marketing department decided to replace the coffee base with dextromethamphetamine. Now, I'm no chemist, but I know what methamphetamine is, and to my knowledge, itchiness is one of the symptoms of its use. My best guess would be that dextromethamphetamine would be more expensive than coffee, so why would they be using this chemical? Because meth is addictive. This is not like the recommendation for Nuka-Cola Quantum, where the marketing department was suggesting to replace the more expensive Strontium-85 with the more dangerous but cheaper Strontium-90. The goal here was to create repeat business through actual chemical addiction. I'll grant you, we have entire industries in the real world that base their income on the addictions of their consumers. but. It's just so starkly obvious here where they were replacing coffee, the supposed primary flavor of this brew, with something completely different and likely far more addictive than caffeine. Back to the city of Sutton though. The other pre-war story that we know was that of the Overseer of Vault 76 herself. At the north end of town you can find the pre-war home of the Overseer. 
She spent many of her years here before the war, where she fondly recalls listening to radio serials with her parents. The Overseer is a lifelong learner, having spent her childhood years earning straight A's, a trait I have to think was fostered at the very least by her father, a teacher. Her mother, a miner, died in a mining accident during the Overseer's junior year of high school, but not before introducing her to her future fiancé, Evan. Evan was a year ahead of the Overseer at school, and he had headed off to the mines upon graduation, while she went on to Vault Tech University. After four years, she graduated with honors and was slated for an overseer's position, a point of pride for her father, who was in ailing health by that time. The overseer and Evan moved into a small house in Welch, an event that was followed shortly by her father's death. She discovered the true nature of the societal preservation program, but by that time she seems to have believed that the ends justified the means. Her knowledge of the intention of the project was discovered, and she was told that Vault 76 would be a control vault. As the war loomed, she was told that she could lead Vault 76, but not if she was married. Her fiancé Evan didn't make the cut of the best and the brightest. In an act that she would regret many times in her life, she broke off the engagement and moved home to Sutton, to live in the house that she'd grown up in. She seems to have chosen to sleep in her old bed, using her parents' bed as a place to store boxes of documents. In the basement, strange of the location of the only bathroom in the house and a half bath of that, we can find piles of vault tech crates, potentially brought in before the war to serve as an extra stash of supplies for the overseer after the exodus from the vault. I have to say that again though, there is only one bathroom in this house and it's a half bath. Ah. Anyway, the overseer was here on the morning of Saturday, October 23rd, 2077, eating breakfast when the early warning went out. She ran out the door, leaving her food on the table where it can still be found today, rotting away. The next time she would set foot in this town would be 25 years later upon exiting the vault on October 22, 2102. But there are stories that took place between the day where nuclear fire darkened the world and Reclamation Day Eve. Sutton likely experienced the same fate as the rest of Appalachia on that day. Bright flashes of light issued forth from the horizon. Clock stopped, the earth shook. The skies began to darken. Those without spaces in vaults retreated into what shelters they could find or fled to where they thought they might find aid. After the nuclear winter, the new normal began. In Charleston, the first responders began to gain a sense of autonomy, eventually taking the orders of the Charleston Emergency Government as advice. The responders, as their unified organization became known, spread across Appalachia everywhere west of the Savage Divide. In these early days, they were not all trained to the same level of competence, and this issue reared its head in Sutton. The next part is in part speculation and in part based on source documents. When the responders arrived in Sutton, they found a cult of sorts operating out of the church. The leader of this group was a raider who had been killing travelers passing through Sutton. He managed to dupe a group that he had just barely escaped the maniac who'd been killing people in the area. He led them to the church to pray and they followed. He continued duping the group, taking their things for his own use, actions that drew the ire of a more devout member of the congregation. As the fear that he would be caught rose, the leader mixed up a bathtub of poisoned drink and got the congregation to commit a mass suicide. Him not included, of course. The responders who had arrived to assist the people of Sutton were horrified with what had happened, returning to Flatwoods with tales of the insanity that they had witnessed. Following this, the responders created the volunteer training program to better prepare people for the world after. Sometime after this mass suicide, Sutton became home to a group of raiders who erected enormous barriers on Main Street decked out with the number 666. The raiders camped out in local buildings and even brought in a trailer to serve as a sort of chuck wagon. The raiders seemed to have been fairly disgusting, placing an outhouse over the prisoner cage so they could defecate on the settlers within. These raiders were met with the same fate as the rest of Appalachia during the scorching, and by 2097, the town was empty. To backtrack slightly, it appears that one of the town's former residents was attempting to repair an airplane and the garage on Main Street. There is also the case of the maybe stolen, maybe taken for repairs carousel horse. Both Tyler County Fairgrounds and the Camden Park carousels are missing a horse. Strangely enough though, Wavy Willards, which has a carousel as the symbol on the map, does not have a carousel on site. But I digress. In 2103, the overseer returned to Sutton, but not to her parents' home, to the house on the hill overlooking Sutton. She restored this home, and from this perch she plots the restoration of Appalachia with the help of her faithful Mr. Handy Davenport. In her office upstairs, the overseer stores mementos from her travels across post-apocalyptic Appalachia like uniforms from joining both the Fire Breathers and the U.S. Army. Her restoration of the house makes it probably the best kept site in Appalachia, outside of the White Springs Bunker. But that's all for the history of Sutton and the Fallout universe. Let's get to the real world history of Sutton and Flatwoods. Let's go back further than we ever have before in these videos, back 480 million years ago, when the Appalachian Mountains were formed with the creation of Pangaea. At that time, the Appalachians ran all the way from that land into the land that became Scotland and these mountains neighbor the Atlas Mountains in modern Morocco. These many, many years ago, the Appalachians were as tall as the Rockies, eventually eroding over the intervening hundreds of millions of years to their current height. 
160 million years after the Appalachians began their uplift thanks to the collisions of the continents forming Pangaea? The Pennsylvanian period began, a time when the carboniferous plants that fossilized into the coal of Appalachia grew, died, and were buried under rock and mud. Over the next many millions of years, the continents shifted, dinosaurs rose and fell, ice ages came and went. The theories on the earliest settlement in North America are always shifting as archaeological evidence is accumulated, but it's believed to be that sometime between 33 and 25,000 years ago, during the last glacial period, humans began to cross the land bridge over the Bering Strait, eventually reaching the area that became West Virginia, specifically the Kanawha and Ohio River valleys around 14,000 years ago. These people were hunter-gatherers and are believed to have potentially hunted the megafauna of North America to extinction, although there has been another theory posited on those extinctions related to climate change. The earliest agricultural societies of West Virginia that I can find are peoples of the Adena culture, or at least peoples related to that culture, who occupied the area between 500 BC and 100 AD. I've spoken of the Adena before, so to avoid recapping too much, I'll just say that they lived in the river valleys of West Virginia, farming amaranth, sumpweed, sunflowers, and squash. They lived in round huts with conical roofs and sometimes palisaded villages. They built large burial mounds for the dead, particularly for those who were more wealthy among them and traded with other cultures in a trading network that brought them everything from shells from the coast to copper trinkets from the Great Lakes. Corn or maize appears to have reached the area around 100 AD, but it took time to spread, eventually becoming a large part of the native economy by around 1000 AD. Around this same time, the Fort Ancient culture seems to become dominant in the area. The mound building, which has formed a large part of our definition for the Adena people, appears to have faded with the Fort Ancient peoples, but they still built mounds, albeit smaller ones. Instead, they built animal effigies, similar to the Serpent Mound in Peebles, Ohio. Villages of the Fort Ancient were more permanent as agriculture had become more developed. The peoples of the Fort Ancient culture appear from bone analysis to have perhaps got a little too far in the use of corn in their diets, which led to malnutrition in some cases. The Fort Ancient culture went into decline around 1650, with some of its people absorbed by the Shawnee Indians. A theory behind their decline is the introduction of European diseases in the early 17th century. As previously stated, the Europeans arrived in Virginia in the 17th century, really the 16th century when you consider the Akakan Mission, a Spanish attempt to establish a Jesuit mission on the Virginia Peninsula. The Spanish failed and their party was massacred. On April 26, 1607, the English colonists who founded Jamestown arrived and established the first successful European outpost in Virginia. On the same peninsula, the Spanish had failed to settle 36 years prior. The Blue Ridge Mountains were reached by an expedition in 1670, and the New River, a tributary of the Ohio River, was reached by another expedition in 1671. For decades, the area west of the Allegheny Mountains was extremely difficult to settle. There were no good roads over the mountains. The area was occupied by hostile natives, and the French had claim to the area. In 1763, the French ceded their claim to the Ohio Valley to the British, following their defeat in the French and Indian War. This would have made the Ohio Valley more open to settlement, if not for the Proclamation of 1763, in which the British government declared the area off-limits to settlement. In 1768, the Iroquois surrendered their claim to the Terry in the Treaty of Fort Stanwix, though they didn't really control the territory they ceded and what is now West Virginia. So the colonial authorities had to negotiate treaties with the Cherokee in 1768 and 1770 to open the area to settlement. There had been conflicts between the settlers and the natives before these treaties, and they continued after them, as the Shawnee had not been signatories to either treaty. The Shawnee, based in Ohio, had been using West Virginia as a hunting ground, and they launched raids against the encroaching British colonists. We've discussed these raids at length in the past, particularly in the video on Lewisburg, so I'll just say that the Shawnee under Chief Cornstalk were defeated by the colonial militia at the Battle of Point Pleasant on October 10, 1774, increasing the safety of the new settlements in the region. Going back just a little, I can now bring you some history on Braxton County from John Davison Sutton's History of Braxton County in Central West Virginia, published in 1919. You can find it as a free ebook on Google. John D. Sutton, born in Flatwoods in 1884, was the grand nephew of the John D. Sutton for whom Sutton is named, and the son of Felix Sutton, a representative of Braxton County to the first state legislature. His is an interesting book to be sure. At 101 years old, it speaks of the great wealth that the state has produced, having been written in the run-up to West Virginia's richest era before the Great Depression. He says that West Virginia has been referred to as the Switzerland of America, and remarks on the great agricultural production of the state, alongside its bounty of coal, fueling the mills of Pittsburgh. Getting to some of the history I found here, though, he says that prior to 1716, no crossing of the Alleghenies by the British had been successful. When a crossing was finally made, the land was claimed for the king and was made part of the Virginian county of Essex. Over the next century, Essex County was split into many different counties, from which Braxton County would eventually be formed. The land was scattered in 1784 at the behest of John Allison, who held 11,000 acres of land in the area. The first settlers to come to the area were the Carpenter family, many of the members of which were massacred by Indians in 1792. As for Sutton itself, the first settler appears to have been John or 
Adam O'Brien, I found both names listed, whichever O'Brien, they are said to have lived in a sycamore tree before building a cabin that John D. Sutton found in 1798 when visiting the area. This is the John D. Sutton who was the great uncle of the author. That John D. Sutton built a home there for his family in 1810. The town of Sutton, originally called Suttonville, previously Newville, was founded in 1835. The earliest reference I can find to Flatwoods is where he says that Reverend John Clark visited the area between 1830 and 1835, founding a Methodist Protestant church in the area. Flatwoods was formally incorporated in 1902. By 1919, John D. Sutton refers to Flatwoods as a thriving village of about 200 with two churches, a school, 10 shops, and a B&O railroad depot. He claims that the town was named for the flat land at the head of the Salt Lake and Little Kanawha and Granny Creeks. Braxton County was formed in 1836 from parts of Lewis, Kanawha, and Nicholas counties, and was named in the honor of Carter Braxton. Born in 1736, Braxton was a plantation owner and merchant, and by 1760, a representative for King William County in the Virginia House of Burgesses, until that body was dissolved by Royal Governor Lord Dunmore in June 1774. Carter Braxton then joined the Patriot Committee of Safety in Virginia, and in 1775 became a representative of Virginia in the Continental Congress. He was a signatory to the Declaration of Independence, lost most of his wealth supporting the Patriot cause in the Revolution, and died in 1797 at the age of 61. But let's get back to the county that was named for him on the 100-year anniversary of his birth. The Western Gully Turnpike was built through Sutton, crossing the Elk River with a suspension bridge in 1853. This turnpike connected the Staunton Parkersburg Turnpike and the James River Kanawha Turnpike, which, along with his semi navigable Elk River, made Sutton important for regional transportation. A quick note on the Elk River. No, there don't seem to be any elk that live in the area now, but I do believe that there were some at one time in the same way that woodland bison used to live all the way east of the Appalachians, but they were hunted uh, to extinction in the area. Uh, now, the Delaware tribe called it the Walnut River. Well, in their own language, obviously. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it because I would butcher it. Uh, the Miami tribe referred to it as the Walnut River as well. While the Shawnee referred to it as the River of Fat Elk. Or they called it something else that meant plenty of fat elk. The Civil War hit Sutton hard. The city provided a volunteer unit that served the Union and quartered many Union soldiers. Thanks to its strategic location, it was attacked, with much of the downtown burned by Confederate troops in 1861. Nearby Bulltown was home to assault works, of which both sides sought control. John Davis' Sutton, the author of the book, served the Union in the Civil War. In yet another example of how the Civil War split families, his second cousin, F.J. Sutton, served the Confederacy. Interestingly, his book has a section that names the slave owners of Braxton County, and he notes that the emancipated slaves in his hometown of Sutton are well respected, and that one of the last remaining former slaves of Braxton County, Momon Ray, was the owner of a large amount of land, and a well-known practitioner of acts of kindness. It took time for Sutton to rise from the ashes, but as it did, the industries of Braxton County grew as well. The region produced sorghum cane, sugar from sugar trees, lumber, coal, oil, gas, silk, and leather. Lumber has been big business in Braxton County for many years, and Sutton is still home to a large lumber yard. Before we leave the history of John Davis and Sutton behind, I want to talk about him a little, because I feel like this little bit of his life gives such a snapshot of life in those days. Mr. Sutton had ten children, four sons and six daughters born between 1867 and 1887. Twenty years. When this book was published in 1919, only four of those children were still alive. His daughters, Susan, Bertha, and Nancy, all died before the age of 10, and all within the year 1877. His daughter Jesse lived to 27, dying in 1909. The last of his children to be born, the twins James and Mariah, died young as well. James at less than a month old, and Mariah at age 6. When considering this, how lucky are we to be living in the modern world, where childhood mortality rates have dropped so low in comparison? The last thing I'm going to say about John Davis's son is this quote, West Virginia is a land of tragedies if we but knew them all. Tragedies that brought the deepest sorrows to the mountain homes of a race of fearless pioneers. Much of his writings on his state are a beat, but there are times when the hardship endured by the people of this time come through. John Sutton died in 1941 at the age of 97, the last living Union veteran of Braxton County. Getting back to Sutton, though. The Sutton Branch Railroad from Flatwoods to Sutton was built by the West Virginia and Pittsburgh Railroad in 1898 purchased by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, and abandoned by them in 1930. The B&O Railroad also operated the Sutton subdivision that linked Gasaway to Sutton until 1984, when that line was abandoned. The rail line running through Flatwoods from Burnsville to the north to Cowan in the south is still operational. Much of Sutton's historic downtown was constructed in the late 19th to the early 20th centuries, a feature I found with most of the towns I've covered in West Virginia. I've had trouble finding a lot of information on Braxton County in the early 20th century, 
Aside from what I've already said, I know that West Virginia in the 20s had a lot of fighting between miners and the corporations that employed them. The population of Braxton County reached its peak at 23,973 for the 1920 census, and has declined in almost every census since. The state went into a period of decline with the Great Depression, and while the economy recovered with the Second World War, technology began to replace miners. I have to think that with the more diversified economy of Braxton County, that they experienced less economic hardship from the shift than the southern part of the state did. The Flood Control Act of 1938 authorized, along with many other projects, the construction of the Sutton Dam on the Elk River just upstream of town. The construction on the dam began in 1949, and though construction was halted for the Korean War, it was completed in 1961 at a cost of $35 million. The Army Corps of Engineers maintains the dam, which offers both flood control and recreation with a marina in the Elk River Wildlife Management Area. On September 2, 1952, brothers Edward May and Fred May, along with their friend Tommy Heyer, say they saw a bright object cross the sky and land at a local farm. The boys, along with Kathleen May, two local kids, and a West Virginia National Guardsman attempted to find what they saw. They crested a hill where they said to have seen a pulsing red light. When investigating this, they momentarily saw a figure with a round red face surrounded by a pointed hood. Descriptions of this monster in Flatwoods seem to have varied by observer and over time. But at the time, the story was fairly widespread across the country. There is a museum dedicated to the Flatwoods monster in Sutton. The population of Braxton County continued to fall until the 1980 census when it rose to 13,894, a 9.7% increase from the 1970 census, before again falling 6.4% to 12,998 in 1990. The population rose 13.1% for the 2000 census to 14,702, before again falling to an estimated population in 2019 of 13,957. Today, Sutton and Flatwoods are home to many hotels, restaurants, and recreational opportunities. I think that'll do it for the history of Sutton and the Fallout universe, and the history of Flatwoods and Sutton in the real world. This has been the Erasable Cartographer. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.